to day one of rebooting the music mainframe, control I'll delete, uh, a symposium about all things music and technology. My name is Maud Salvi. I'm the executive director of the Sled Island Music and Arts Festival. Uh, and the symposium is a collaboration with our good friends at Beta, the platform to send and receive secure audio files. So today's discussion is going to delve into music algorithms. So we've all heard about it, obviously. They've become ubiquitous with music listening. Uh, we've all come across new artists that we may not have otherwise, thanks to them. But contrary to popular belief, algorithms are not quite the democratic utopia that we'd like them to be. Um, they are actually have inherent biases um, that affect them. And so today we're going to discuss and learn uh, with our panelists about how they actually work and what can be done about it. So we're really happy to have with us our moderator today, Annabelle Ross, uh, who will take things over uh, in a few minutes, and also Joel Sparks and Peggy Hogan. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I want to thank our funders, the Government of Canada, the Canada Council for the Arts, Factor, and Canada's private radio broadcasters. Um, before I let you go, I just want to plug tomorrow's panels. So we have one great discussion at noon that I'm personally very excited about called the Minimum Standard Conundrum that is all about uh, musicians' compensation for live shows. We'll look at uh, what we can learn from the visual arts sector where Carfac has been advocating successfully for many decades now and how this can be applied maybe to music. And later on at 6 p.m. we'll have another great discussion uh, about how technology can be used to make music making more accessible. So you can tune in for both these events and all the rest of the symposium events all week using this same Zoom link uh, you used to attend this panel right now. So it's pretty easy. So I hope you'll join us. And uh, for tonight's discussion, feel free to write your questions in the, in the chat. We'll try to address them at the end of the talk. And uh, I think that's all for me. So. I'll leave you with Annabelle and our great panelist. Thank you. Is that better? Much. Okay. <laughs> I'll start again. My name's Annabelle Ross. I'm a journalist from Melbourne, Australia. I'm currently based in New York and I write about music and culture mostly for publications such as Resident Advisor, Mixmag, Vice, The Guardian. Um, I'm particularly interested in diversity, representation, safety and inclusion in music. And I've been writing about sexual assault in music for the past couple of years, um, specifically in electronic music. And I'm currently working on a podcast on the same topic. And I'll let Peggy and Jewel introduce themselves as well. Maybe start with you, Peggy. Thanks, Annabelle. Uh, my name's Peggy Hogan. I'm joining y'all from Montreal, also known as Jujage. It is the unceded territory of the Mohawk Nation. Um, I am the marketing and label manager of Outside Music and Next Door Records. And I'm also an artist known as Huali. My name is Jewel Sparks. Um, I'm tuning in from Berlin. <laughs> it's early morning, but I'm really happy to be here. Um, I actually am the owner of Bit House Group and United 17 Ventures. And we have a um, initiative called Beyond the Music Label Series, which I actually launched, I think it was in 2011 in San Francisco. Um, where we um, scout uh, emerging artists and we help them with development. And what's really exciting right now is everything that's going on in the industry, all the changes, metaverse, um, like uh, being able to secure your music on blockchain, 
Um, so we kind of use the series as a way to kind of accelerate and incubate um, uh, uh, music uh, entrepreneurs and musicians um, and try to help uh, change and transform uh, the music industry. So I'm very happy to be here and part of this panel today. Thanks so much. Um, I thought it would be interesting to start with. I think both of you have probably confronted barriers to music discovery in different ways. I think maybe Peggy, as an artist, it might have been something that you've encountered yourself. And I wondered what your experience with that had been. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I feel like um, the, the barriers have been multifold for me. Uh, I'll say one of the issues in my project is that I'm very in between genre. Um, I rap a little bit. I sing a little bit. Um, the beats are somewhat hip hop, but they're somewhat electronic. And um, interestingly, I, I think at the very beginning of my career that seemed to be to, to matter less back in the golden era of the blog. Um, I think that was, I was able to cut through a little bit more. In the DSP world, it's very important to be genre identifiable, let's say, um, in terms of playlisting and um, the way that people think of my music. So that has certainly been something I've been navigating a lot. Um, on a more social level, um, I, I think as an artist, I have a very kind of unique path into um, the communities I found myself operating in here in Montreal. Um, I didn't come up in what most people would kind of consider the traditional hip hop scene here. Um, because when I was very young, I went through um, an abusive relationship with somebody in that community. So I, I circumvented that when I started making my own music and um, was really embraced by the queer community. That's where I did a lot of my first shows. And um, later was really, really embraced by indie promoters and indie festivals like Pop Montreal Festival. So, uh, you know, I, I found a path that was alternative, but yeah, I think both kind of technologically and industry wise in terms of the, the way I'm classified, um, as well as kind of social factors that they've all kind of um, impacted the path that I've taken. Mm -hmm. And Jewel, what about you? I mean, with the Beyond the Music Label Initiative, you were saying that I think you're in the middle of a series. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us about how that works. Um, so basically um, we spend like six um, months scouting, uh, dividing like the different semifinal rounds um, based upon genre. Uh, this particular one I'm really excited about because it's specifically called the diversity edit where we're only um, basically uh, looking for intentionally um, female uh, singwriters and um, performers. And so that's been really great. Like even some of the jury members have, have commented on how strange it is to specifically only focus, <laughs> that we've only focused on women. Like, cause they're like, but I know this guy and this guy. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, there's always gonna be tons of guys. But this specifically, I think sometimes you have to be intentional in order to kind of like elevate and um, I think kind of organically achieve like over time um, the balance that's needed. So what I think I've noticed is like this interesting also transformation amongst the jury members, because I think since before, you know, they weren't really paying a conscious effort as to like kind of what genders, um, you know, they're scouting for looking for, I think now by default next time when they just in general participate in different activities as the, as, um, brand and label owners, um, as journalists, et cetera, I think that naturally, you know, they'll, they'll be this amazing mix and balance that they never really thought of before. Mm -hmm. So it just, it become a habit of just, you know, things naturally becoming inclusive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. I, I thought it was interesting, Peggy, what you said about um, your music, not necessarily being genre 
genre identifiable. And I was wondering if in the age of the algorithm, has that affected like the ways in which you make music or made you think about it in ways that you mightn't necessarily want to? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I definitely think about it. I can't say that it's drastically impacted my approach. And if anything, I feel like um, through frustration, I've dug my heels in even more in terms of leaning into the kind of sound I want to craft. Um, but I'll, I'll say that I do go through a, like a three month shadow period after every release where I'm like, damn, I really just should have picked one lane and stuck to it. And why couldn't I just label that whole release one genre? Um, because it, it does make playlisting really quite um, obscure. You know, it's it becomes an abstract thing to pitch. Um, I know, I mean, I now work with <laughs> what was my team. I'm now working at the label I was, I'm was i signed to. Um, but I know that that's been a consideration always where they certainly, they love my music for what it is. They, they saw it for um, its value regardless, but the issue with pitching when it's not a, a cohesive project and each track maybe fits in a different lane or, or a different set of playlists can be really challenging for a label and a distributor to navigate. Mm, for sure. Has it, has it made you rethink the idea of the album at all? Like, are you, are you less inclined to want to create an album instead of an EP or single? Yeah, I mean, that's also a very interesting question. Um, I, I'll admit that I'm very old school in the sense that I love, I'm a vinyl collector. So to me, as an artist, an LP is like the ultimate product. Like, it's like, here's my life's work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I really enjoy presenting my music that way. It feels like, you know, just like a real milestone, I think, as an artist. That being said, um, looking at it from, from the label manager hat, I'm always telling artists to think outside of um, the album as a format. And if that's an end goal, that's great, um, especially because we still shill vinyl at Outside Next Door. Um, but we're really trying to kind of break apart what, what an album campaign looks like. I think one of the things that is very frustrating is that the kind of classic model um, since DSPs have kind of taken over is the three to four singles leading up to the album release. So you try to build momentum on a monthly schedule and try to get all the press and try to get all the playlists. And then all of a sudden the record comes out and then it's over because once that music's out in an album format, it can't be playlisted anymore. And so mm -hmm. it really kind of stops things dead in their tracks. And then artists are like, oh, like, this is out now, what do I do? And I'm like, go on tour, uh, write new music, try to do a version in a different language. Do you got any remixes? Like, <laughs> it's like, there's really um, a push to have content all the time. So mm. yeah, I'm, I'm really thinking a lot about um, stretching out that process, maybe keeping the idea that things will be an album um, under wraps for longer and um, even kind of like bundling things together, like four singles put out a six song EP and then another few singles and then that EP then joins an album later on or, or something like that. So certainly I think it, the, um, the pace at which stuff is happening is really making everyone rethink the, the classic release strategy. Mm -hmm. what, what other advice would both of you give to artists in terms of getting their music heard or reaching a bigger audience? Jewel, do you want to take this? I've been talking oh. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I actually think uh, the secret sauce is, is interacting and mixing with people that aren't the same. So, I mean, sometimes we were just talking uh, before about like, you know, when we go to different conferences or festivals, how like if you're from one country, how some people just still cluster with the same people from the same country. I mean, it's kind of the same. I think if you're a musician, I mean, I think uh, I think uh, it's kind of nice to, to swim in other ponds. 
because everybody enjoys music, you know, whether you're like a top executive with like the most maybe stressful, boring job in the world. I mean, you listening to music to relax, um, whether you're a chef, whether you're even like a, a, a bicycle carrier, you know, so I just think it's really important to, to socialize and to, to kind of mix up your social circles and make sure that you just show up at things that aren't just always music related. And I think that it's, it's really about building communities, building networks. Everybody listens to, to music, just like everyone eats. So, I mean, it's not like just because you have a food product, you only need to always hang out with, at food conferences or, you know, or, mm-hmm. or whatever. I mean, like everybody eats so you can start and spark a conversation with everyone. So I really think community building is the most important thing, utilizing all the different types of social channels, um, friends of friends of friends um there's like sports events there's like ads for brands there's so many different touch points uh for music so again just kind of like builds your social circle mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah I think it makes really really good points there um it, it, I think it can feel daunting to be like oh we'll just go and mix with other people but there's so many um points of connection between even just looking at other realms in the entertainment industry and um you know sync is a huge piece of how artists make their income now so the more people you know in the film and television world the better it is for you as an artist for instance um and and just in terms of the pesky algorithm um as an undiscovered artist it's very very challenging to get playlisted but something that can go a really long way is getting a lot of pre-saves on an upcoming release and having a lot of followers on your accounts. And so if you're able to tap your community and your networks to just be like, hey, like, I know it's nerdy for me to ask you this and maybe you don't like to follow artists normally, like it's not something that's that you do, but it's gonna go a long way. It's actually something that's gonna benefit me. People will go and put that effort in for you and, and that can really change the way that, um, releases get picked up in the playlist world. Mm. I suppose you could say that that's a way of circumnavigating the algorithm in itself is because the algorithm feeds you more of what you've what you've been listening to and so what you like essentially. So I guess that's where networking with different people, different groups, different scenes um, is a way of diversifying your audience and sort of trying to connect with people outside of that sphere. Yeah, it's really important because I think these algorithms are really uh, dangerous. I think I found myself like a week ago, like, because I've been looking at art uh, a lot, you know, as an art collector as well. And, you know, after coming from Basel and then going to about to go to freeze in in, uh, Los Angeles. And I was like, I started to notice that everything in my feed was art related. So I was like, let me start like looking at some other stuff. Mm -hmm. because like you have to train also the algorithms because you can unfortunately get like in a niche you know so if you like rock music and you spend a week of rock music unfortunately maybe only rock music comes up and then that discovery piece becomes like totally like mute you know like it just doesn't happen Um, Mm -hmm. and still you end up stuck without uh, being able to identify and listen to other music that you may enjoy just because your preference um, at this point in time in your life and your world is this. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, I think at the start of the pandemic, what happened was everybody was getting, you know, thrown everything, like from everything that they didn't even really care about. And that's when I think this amazing kind of discovery started to happen with people realizing, you know, that, oh, wow, that's a great music. Oh, but I never heard of them, but that didn't mean, that didn't mean that they weren't great. You know, so that's the other thing I think sometimes that we have to be careful of is that sometimes just because someone has a lot of followers or doesn't have a lot of followers, I should say, that doesn't mean that that's not music and, and uh, an artist that shouldn't be like paid attention to or um, that isn't like label worthy. So how do you disrupt that? How do you, um, because it's kind of just like introverts and extroverts, 
Mm-hmm. You know, some creators, for example, they create and they're the ones that want all the likes on their account. Other creators connect with other people who are creators and instead the likes go to other people's accounts. Um, so I think it, it's kind of tricky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and how much would you say the responsibility for um, increasing your profile or getting your music heard, how much responsibility would you say should lie with the artist as opposed to the publications and the platforms and the agencies and all the other people involved? Yeah, I mean, this is a really fine line to balance. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's something I talk to uh, uh, the artists on the label about all the time, because naturally as a label, we want artists to be invested in their careers and and make the right moves to to grow um, their careers. At the same time, um, we're there to support them with financial support and our network. So I think there needs to be a balance there. Um, it's interesting, Jewel, what, what you bring up around numbers. So um, something I, I talk to a lot of a about is like, how much do we look at the metrics when we're looking to sign a new act? And for myself as an artist that was signed with very, very poor numbers, um, I like to think that labels will do that. Um, and it increasingly is happening less, <laughs> but I think it's it's really important for labels to look at um, what is the artist's commitment to pushing their, their music forward? Are they willing to do the legwork in terms of like, do they want to go on tour? If they don't want to go on tour, what are they going to offer instead? Like, um, so yeah, I mean, I think there needs to be a balance. That being said, um, one of the barriers that we haven't really talked about yet is the huge financial barriers that exist within the music industry. Like this is an incredibly bougie industry. And if you're an artist that can't afford a publicist, then you're way behind someone that um, is able to even able to afford a publicist for like one month. Um, so that can be really, really big. And I think if you're a developing artist that Um, Maybe you live in a country that is not Canada, so you are not accessing tons of government funding um, and you're not in a place where you're generating a lot of income. Um, It helps to do that legwork. It helps to send out those emails yourself, make the appeals, figure out who your favorite journalists are, write them, try and figure out the tastemakers, send your music to them. So it's a balance. And I think it's a disservice to your own music if you're not willing to kind of do that legwork to get it out there. It's also a question of time, isn't it? Which I guess is another resource in itself. And if you don't have the means to pay for that publicity and to pay for the help in sort of getting the word out there, um, then yeah, that's a lot of your own time and resources that you probably don't have if you can't afford to pay for those things. Um, and yeah, I think it puts those people at a real disadvantage having to do all of that legwork in addition to making the music and then they have less time to spend on their art. Definitely. It's amazing how little time artists have for their actual music making. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting too what you said about being judged by numbers, which I think is something that, you know, 10 years ago, we're talking like streaming numbers, obviously. It just wasn't wasn't even an issue and you were judged on the quality of your work and how compelling you were as a as an artist as a person um yeah it's kind of crazy to think that the numbers in many cases now like that's the first and the main thing that people will look at yeah Hmm. and how important do you think it is that companies hire diverse staff um, and staff from underrepresented communities and staff in different geographic locations to sort of help um, to help people in those same situations have a better chance of getting their music heard. Peg, um, are you waiting for me? <laughs> try to give space. Okay, okay, I mean, okay. I'll say that it's very important. Um, it, everybody has inherent biases, everyone has blind spots. And I think um, the more a team is diverse, the, the more 
the larger range of needs are going to be serviced by the team. Um, if the team is not diverse, there needs to be a huge amount of curiosity and humbleness amongst the team members in order to, to learn about what barriers there are. Um, the, the geographic thing is, is very interesting. Like I work with an artist um, in Iqaluit, which is for those of you who don't know the Arctic of Canada. Um, and like it costs thousands upon thousands of dollars just to fly from there to somewhere like Ottawa or Montreal, just to get a tour started, you know, um, or to get to a showcase. So um, I think when you apply regular kind of industry models to an artist like that, and you're like, okay, well, you know, you just got to get down to Toronto and showcase, it's really important. And they're like, well, I don't have $3,000 to get on a flight. <laughs> That's a huge blind spot. And I think either you need to be um, willing to be, as I said, like adaptable and curious, um, or you need someone on your team that's like, hey, listen, like, <laughs> I've come across this. This is something I know personally, and everyone needs to be aware. Mm -hmm. um, I am a huge fan of uh, diverse teams. Um, and when I say diverse, I'm talking about age. I'm talking about ethnicity. I'm talking about race. I'm talking about even career paths. Um, because um, you'll be amazed, um, you know, that just because you haven't spent 20 years in one particular industry, that doesn't mean that you can't add tremendous value to an industry, because at the end of the day, it's about business, and it's about business models, it's about strategy, and those things apply to all making money, return on investment, that's not something that's independent to just one industry, so like if you come from a highly technical uh, industry and then you go into a more creative industry, um, I, I think that person who comes from a highly technical industry going into a creative industry is going to identify different ways to potentially, um, you know, work out the algorithms, figure out new uh, ways to generate revenue. So diversity is so important. Um, and given how everything is like... Uh, digital now, transient, um, you know, like it's not like you can just be on your island or have your company and run it just like independently. Everything works succinctly together, uh, believe it or not, you know, so you may have your label or um, you may have your label, you may have your brand, but everything's interconnected right now. So it's really important to have people on the team that can kind of help streamline those processes and like Peggy said, like even identify, have different music tastes. I mean, if you run a, a music label company and like everybody loves rock, uh, that's probably not going to help out the fact that, you know, there's more than just rock in the music <laughs> industry. There's other genres. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that also affects the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Sure. I was um I was reading a study the other day that said and it might have even increased by now something like 60,000 new tracks are released on Spotify every day which equates to I think one new track every second um so as an artist how how can you cut through that noise I mean it's incredibly difficult um I I was I was a fly on the wall for a Spotify con conversation recently and um yeah. someone there said something like we were talking about someone a release that was coming out 11 months after another release and someone there was like oh this is basically a comeback and I was like oh no <laughs> this is the, this is the last wow. thing I want to hear from <laughs> someone that is in charge of getting the music out there um I mean I think it goes back to finding alternatives to simply relying on DSPs, like finding those ways to create community, direct access to fans. One day we will tour again, and that will be very, very important. Being able to create a vibe and a, a real connection with people um, on the stage and through any other means you can. Like, I think, um, I always encourage the artists on the label to create as much content as possible with a single asset. So if you're doing a music video, do as much behind the scenes as you can, like put as much of yourself into that process, document everything. 
Um, because, you know, you want to just be able to have like tons of content to get out there. Um, and don't be afraid, I think, to find a niche that is not music. Like, um, we have an artist named uh, Abigail LaPelle and her publicists are like, okay, like you love to do bike touring and camping. Like let's do a whole series on like your camping gear and how it makes you feel the cycle. And you know, like, I think people want to know that you're a person. So it, I think it's easier to generate content if you're being authentic and um, creating stuff that is true to your life. Like you're not trying to do this whole hullabaloo that that is not what's already happening like if you love to go to shows talk about that if you love to read books talk about that like um yeah just trying to find a space where you can be yourself as much as possible for your audience and and find community that way um because yeah i mean if we're relying solely on the dsps it's uh it's a scary world mm -hmm which is digital signal processors. Digital streaming platforms. But also digital <laughs> signal, but also, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So the reason I said that is because someone did ask if you could give them a reference point. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So see that diversity, see on the tech, it's like digital signal processors, which is also kind of the same too, in a different <laughs> way, but it's the tech piece. So that's why I said that. To, to, to liven this up a bit. Do you think it's possible for an artist to break through without a social media presence in this day and age? <laughs> um, yes, if they have the right network. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't think, I mean, obviously digital is taking over the world and society, but I mean, we do have to, and it's nice to have a sit down and have a cup of coffee in the face-to-face -face, the way that we used to do it. I think we're going to see like an interesting like trend um, starting to happen where people are going, will go back in time to the things like before. And that's also a way to stand out. I think, you know, I don't like always try to blend in with everyone else. Like I was thinking about what Peggy said, or no, actually when you asked the question about, um, or you mentioned about like one song every minute on Spotify. And then I thought about all the other tools and resources that like surround Spotify, like for example, Anchor to make a podcast. So like, okay, so if you know everyone's, it's, it's getting harder to be discovered on <laughs> Spotify maybe you can upload your soundbite or your music on a podcasting platform and like try to use, you know, different platforms where people like also like stumble upon your work, stumble upon your music. Um, because there are like a lot of tools that are out there. There's also the jingles that, you know, when you're making a podcast, you can use the jingles that they have. So there's so many different ways that your music can be heard and discovered. So I think you have to um, maybe make an effort to potentially uh, want to think out the box, outside the box. And then again, it's really about, again, I, I can't stress networks, networks, networks. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you were saying that, Jewel, it made me think of there's this one fitness influencer that I do her workout vids and like, I find music on her videos all the time. Like, I'm like, oh, this, I the feel music good is like when I'm <laughs> like full of all of the exercise chemicals <laughs> in my brain. I'm like, I love this song. <laughs> um, as well, I think, I mean, there's a whole world that is about to emerge with Web3. Um, oh, yeah. Just in terms of defining terms. I know we, we need to do that here. Um, I've been negligent, but... Um, Web2, of course, like refers to basically where we're at now in terms of um, we're getting things served to us via these large platforms like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and there's a certain algorithm that feeds that to us. Um, and Web3 is uh, an attempt to democratize this a lot more. It's a lot um, still user generated content, but um, the communities that are, are governing themselves and sharing information um, in alternative ways. So like there's a lot of, of this happening on Discord, for instance, and mm -hmm. yes. the NFT and blockchain world is all about Web3. So I think as more people get onboarded into Web3, we will find a lot of alternatives to social media. 
Um, but as, as it stands right now, I think it is challenging to cut through. Um, that being said, you don't have to be on every single social media platform, like no. find the one that is best for you, that suits your voice best and lean into that. Mm -hmm. Do you encourage your artists to sort of get their head around web three? Is that something that like you're telling the artist on to your label to do? I am allowing the artist to be self-determined <laughs> when it comes to web three. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of information there and, mm. uh, and I'm, I'm just learning myself a lot about the NFT world and doing some prelim research there. And, um, I mean, the thing is, is that there's, there's nothing inorganic about the music industry. Like it is about the people, you know, the connections you make and it's the same in web three. So if you really want to sell your NFT, you're going to have to build a community in the web three world in order to do that. And that also takes time. So, um, certainly I encourage people to be curious if they're interested in technology and they're interested in diving into this stuff, um, they should do it. But we also have a lot of very folksy singer songwriters that want nothing to do with that world. And, and that's, that's, that's them. It's, it's not going to serve them to try and package their, their stuff into, um, into the blockchain as it stands. But I like to say this. Um, so I think it's a, it, it's a give and take because uh, you know, there's discovery, there's ha having uh, like tons of fans, but then there's also, if you do, uh, upload or have your music on the blockchain, it can also just be sitting there and generating revenue, um, for you or speaking for you <clears throat> where you're not proactively speaking. So I actually am a big fan of blockchain, NFTs, all that good stuff. Um, because it helps you, it helps creatives be able to monetize their creativity uh, throughout the process. So you could like write a song and you could have a little jingle. And at the end of the day, you know, if you do put it on the blockchain, if it is NFT, if it's just sitting there, you still continue what you're doing. If you're like, just like a lab rat, if you just want to continue doing what you're doing, you hate all that social stuff, you hate people you know, at least just make and allow and enable technology and the solutions that are out there to work for you so you can still um, be able to uh, generate resources for yourself to continue, uh, uh, you know, your passion. Because like Peggy and Annabelle said, not everybody, you know, is a chatterbox. Not everybody is good with like telling their story or sharing their story. Um, not everyone has the resources to maybe hire a publicist. Um, but this other stuff, it's kind of like if you go and you, uh, you know, I remember when I was growing up, my parents always said, you're definitely going to college because that's the one thing you go, you achieve, and no one can ever take that away from you, no matter what you go through in your career. You know what I mean? Like, no matter what happens, like people give you a job, they can take it away from you. They can, but if you go to school, that's like your hard work. That's something that you've done. So that's kind of the way I also feel about music and, and the creative process. And that's something that you're doing. And so just protect it. And so I think that the, the blockchain and NFTs is a way to do that. And you can still, you don't need to talk to anybody. Have the internet talk to people for you. Um, but just like make sure that you're generating revenue to continue to fulfill your passions and do what you want to do 100%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about live shows? What what role do you feel that live shows play in increasing your profile? And I mean, obviously that's been complicated over the past couple of years and we have live streams instead, but to what degree are they as effective? I think before the pandemic, they were absolutely positively the way to go, you know, because you have a crowd, some people, they came to the to the show specifically because, you know, that one of their bands was playing, then they would bring friends. But I have to honestly tell you that's changed. Um, I think what I'm seeing now is there's some people they're still out there like rah, rah, they're like, whenever there's a window of opportunity <laughs> and they can get outside, <laughs> then they're like 
the first ones like front row and center with a whole bunch of people like yelling, spitting all of them, whatever, that's fine. Um, but I think that there's also, this is also a great time right now, I feel, because it goes back to the diversity of being able to build awareness of your craft in person, virtually, Web 3.0. There's so many more options now. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll totally echo that. Um, it is the most interesting time in the industry in terms of the live show being um, no longer the central piece. Like it used to be at the label that I work for, not a single act would ever possibly get signed if no one on the A&R team had seen them in a show. Like it just would be, yeah. Like, well, thanks for emailing us. Let us know when you're in any of the cities that we live in, would love to see you play. Um, and over the last two years, we've signed more artists than ever. Um, and, and there has been a single, like, we're like, wow, I can't wait to see this artist play live one day, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a really fascinating time where there are a lot more options. Um, I'm really interested to see what happens in a um, theoretical, post-COVID world um, with the live show. Um, I, I wonder if people will be extra hungry for those experiences and what that means for artists. Um, mm -hmm. But the other thing that I, I really wonder about, which is in the opposite spirit of diversity and inclusion is that in this time, as venue closures have been happening across the world, um, there has been a huge consolidation of venues by huge corporations like Live Nation. So even on a local level here in Montreal, we've lost a whole ton of our smaller, like mm -hmm. 100 to 200 capacity rooms that emerging artists would be doing their first shows in. Um, and in this kind of unprecedented sweep, a lot of those rooms have been bought by these much larger promotion companies that if you follow the trail up are owned by Live Nation. And so that's really, really gonna change the access for developing artists to actually play live shows. Um, mm. As well as this kind of bottleneck that we're seeing with artists that are already signed to booking agents are getting priority because booking agents are just professionally rescheduling shows right now. Like that's been their job for the last two years. Like, okay, we'll move it again. Um, so even getting a show right now as an emerging artist is very, very challenging. And I think it's going to take quite some time before we see the fallout of that and, and where all of the, where all of the cards fall with the live music industry. You know, that's why I love what we're doing with Beyond the Music Label series, because like our jury, like they're, it's made up of like producers, uh, label managers, uh, uh partnership uh, like strategic partnership folks from labels and what's interesting is um they're shifting the mindset their mindset in terms of what they're looking for so since we've been doing all the performances virtually sometimes it's unplugged sometimes like they like some of the bands have done like a whole setup like in a studio with you know everyone there but some are just like now like just sitting on their couch playing their guitar without the band and so what's happened is I noticed like last week uh the jury they were like well for the finals, what we really need to ask is, are we looking for someone that's like, could be label ready? Or are we looking for someone that could be a good brand ambassador? Or are we looking for someone whose music, whose songs are great, uh, the songwriting's great, um, licensing? Um, what We should make a decision of exact, or do we want someone that clearly, uh, they said clearly so-and-so and so-and-so, they perform beautifully, but but this other person, you could tell there's a lot there. And so we really should think about, or do we want to, to bring to the final stage an artist that we know the development and that there's just potential. And I loved that conversation because before live show, <laughs> never would have that. It'd be like, okay, who can bring the crowd? Who uh, is just the best performer who has all the fans who has this who has this and now literally they're thinking out the box and they're like wow they're expanding and realizing that 
great artists can fit in all these very different categories. And so what do we want to put first? <laughs> do we want someone that's just, we know they're going to perform well, but that's kind of, they're like, that's kind of boring now. Now we need to look at all these other dimensions. And I think that that's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I love this point. And I think that's a very, very key thing for artists to remember too, is that um, there was once a very kind of narrow and obvious path to how to be like an indie artist. Um, and now there are so many places that you can make strategic partnerships, you can generate income. So it's important for you as an artist to think like, turn that question back around on yourself too, and be like, well, what kind of artist am I? Am I like, am I someone that's going to go for the sync world super, super hard? Am I more of a songwriter? Like, do I want to be kind of crafting the vision behind the scenes or am I incredibly charismatic and I'm going to be a great brand partnerships person? You know, I I think it's important for artists to ask themselves those questions too and really, really lean into those avenues. Or do I want everyone just to use my music on their stories and their reels, (laughs) the creators? So that's what I'm saying. You can by default get tons of uh, like followers indirectly um, by like all these other creators that are creating content all the time and everyone has the jingles. I think that that is also like a really cool way because then now also people are saving the jingles and the songs that they like in the background. It's like, I see now like all these new artists that I've never heard of before, but then like, I see someone's great, some creators like crazy real. And I'm like, oh my God, I like that jingle. And then I'm like, let me save that so I can use that. Yeah, I I wanted to um, ask you, Peggy, about a post. I think it was yesterday on your artist page on Instagram. You posted a Valentine's Day photo um, and made a joke about how, um, or maybe it wasn't a joke, about how you wanted <laughs> you wanted Spotify or you wanted your record label to see you as as much of a success as you see yourself, and to sort of encourage people to follow you on Spotify. And I wondered if you might like to expand on that a bit <laughs> I mean that was definitely a joke being that I <laughs> literally work at the label as, <laughs> as my own a <laughs> um but yeah I mean it is it is this interesting question because um I'm I would say I'm kind of an outlier on the roster I'm really in um somewhat of a different lane although I think kind of the unifying thing at outside next door is just really strong storytelling um but in terms of my sound, I'm, I'm quite different than a lot of the other artists. And, uh, and my numbers are not as strong. Like I really, and, and now being on the inside, I see that more than ever. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm the one looking at the spreadsheets being like, oh, that Huali, okay, got to get her numbers up. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think when we're talking especially about um, underrepresented artists, I'm always encouraging people to get over their own imposter syndrome and Mm. really like lean into believing that you're a success, advocate for yourself, create a coherent strategy for yourself um, and figure out what you're good at and really, really celebrate those things. Um, I'm an incredibly sarcastic person. So all of my social media is going to be incredibly (laughs) sarcastic. I think (laughs) you've picked one of the best posts to illustrate that. Um, I like to kind of, poke and prod at the industry. And um, I think that's what's, that's what's resulted in this strange position I find myself in as my own a and um, But yeah, I mean, obviously I think my label believes in me and, and <laughs> thinks I'm a success, but I, I think every artist needs to keep that in mind for themselves too. And that um, if you're looking at let's say you are a signed artist and you're looking at the rest of your roster and your numbers are different than other people, that doesn't mean that anybody that advocates for you thinks less of you. I think, and you just have to do what you love and find your tribe. You know what I mean? Like not everybody is gonna like love you, but like the people that like reach out to you or the people that enjoy your music, like you know, like gravitate towards that because if they like your music, the, the word of mouth is like really powerful, you know? Mm-hmm. And so like, don't worry about the haters or the non-discoverers. Like if you find 10 people, like 
make those 10 people proud. And then before you know it, it organically grows into more and more and more. And of those 10 people, I mean, shoot, maybe one's like head of partnerships or like creating all the stuff for the next Super Bowl. Uh, and so, I mean, I'm just saying like, again, this is the beautiful thing about music. Like people that enjoy music, come from all walks of life and you never know like when that one fan is just like someone that can change your life I mean you can have 10 fans and that one fan happens to be so-and-so and -and so-and-so and -and -and so-and-so and then before you know it your stuff is like rolled out on a global national worldwide level with touch points and music film brands you know everything um and so that's what just you know just gravitate and towards those that appreciate what you do and don't worry about being the all and be all to everyone and just do what you do love it and that also shows through so can't always please everybody Mm -hmm. for sure we might go to a couple of questions from the chat um there's one that says are there strategies for highly motivated communities whether geographical scenes, subgenre related, et cetera, to mobilize together to actually impact these algorithms or playlists in a meaningful way. A strength in numbers approach when lacking the more traditional networks, team, et cetera, what in a practical sense should those communities try to do to move the needle on algorithms? You know, um... It's about storytelling. I read this great article today. I think it's about storytelling and I think algorithms change based upon the positioning and the words and the storytelling. Like we've heard Peggy throughout our our panel today talk about how her music doesn't fit into any one genre, but at the end of the day, it doesn't fit into one genre, but maybe this week she can say, oh, it's hip hop. Next week she can say, oh, it's pop. Um, so what I'm saying is it, it's true. You kind of, the strategy is I, if we just take Peggy and her music and her category, uh, like what she said, how she doesn't really fit. It's like you make yourself fit based upon what is trending um, and stand out amongst you know so like if everything in one category is all pop but you're actually rock uh maybe you still should post in the pop category just because you'll stand out amongst all the others um so i think you can train algorithms by either um molding or conforming to what they say they're doing and still be the opposite or you can create other um storylines I don't know if that answered the question, but I just think that there's a way the strategy is looking at what looking, listening to what listening and looking at what people say they want. And even if you don't necessarily fit that category, but you want them to become aware, like still place yourself there. Mm -hmm. Disrupt the system. (laughs) um yeah i i don't know if i can speak to the algorithm necessarily but um the question made me think of a group from a called akaluk music and um because i think the question talked about highly motivated communities Mm -hmm. and i i absolutely see akaluk as an example of this like they, this is started as kind of a collective that turned loosely into a label slash music promotion entity, let's say, um, based in Iqaluit. And um, they work basically exclusively with Inuit artists. Um, And I feel like they single-handedly created a scene in Canada's Arctic, like, obviously there are music fans there everybody if there's tiny communities everybody knows each other so it was really really quick for them to create their own touring network in the arctic from community to community um everyone who is a fan within those communities is so deeply engaged because they're they feel that they're family and they become Mm -hmm. invested in these artists very very long term 
Um, so, so the people who are kind of rising and able to make an impact in Canada's South um, are having huge followership and dedicated commitment from their original fans up in the North. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I think even if you are kind of remotely located or um, marginalized in some other way, there is a way to kind of um, create a narrative around what you're doing and find the people that really, really are invested that think that you're a family. That's right. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I know in the electronic music as well, there's lots of examples of groups that have banded together, whether they're from particular parts of Asia or disc women with black and um, black non-binary and female artists and yeah, it's, it's a way of, it wasn't necessarily their intention, but it's a way of banding together. And um, I don't know, I think by doing it as a collective, they empower each other along the way um, and people start to take notice. Yeah, and there's that one quote or that saying, like, if you can't, you know, if that lane's not for you, then create your, your own door, like your own path. And so I think sometimes, again, like trying to fit into pre-existing things that maybe you just don't fit into, um, sometimes it's good just to create your own lane that also like kind of works uh, in parallel um, with what already exists. And if you think about algorithms and how they're built and if the team is not diverse, um, the, the only way to kind of, again, disrupt or fool the algorithm is to try to make it as more diverse in terms of like the content that's put there, because nine times out of 10, the way that it's built or the way that it's programmed, it's definitely not, <laughs> I would say 90% of the time programmed to discover things that aren't understood by the people who write the code or enjoyed by the people who write the code. So you have to write the code on the other end and just dump other content into something that was not meant for you. And then by default, it ends up training it. Um, I think, I don't know if we have time for one more question or not. We're just about out of time. Um, did you want to answer one more? So it's how conscious do you think the average media consumer is of how deeply ingrained their entertainment thinking Netflix, Spotify, and YouTube is in algorithmic culture. What roles do you think could be or are becoming obsolete in the music industry because of this? That's a great question. But it's going to take some time for me to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to come back for another panel. Um, um, I don't know if the average consumer is per se like um, aware of the algorithms or I mean, or aware, you know, kind of how addictive they can be in terms of steering you into the direction that they want you to go. So that's that first part. Um, the other thing is, um, what was the second part? It's what roles do you think could be or are becoming obsolete in the music industry? because of this sometimes the artist discovery you know sometimes some people I've noticed they're relying more on the algorithms to, to help them identify and to find like what we said before like looking at oh the social media numbers and things like that so sometimes it's that's kind of like a crutch it's like oh well we should look at this particular artist because they have a hundred thousand you know but meanwhile not like you know, cleaning off the shelves and like looking at, you know, the artists that are harder to find. Um, so sometimes I think that that's a role that like that's kind of uh, depleting a little bit somewhat. Um, what other roles have you seen, Peggy, where, uh, that labels are cutting back on? I mean, this is an interesting question because as someone that works at a traditional label, I'm incredibly biased toward labels. And I've already talked about how much I love physical formats. Um, in many ways, I think labels are becoming obsolete. Um, and that record labels really need to look at what 
their role in an artist's career is. Um, especially as Web3 takes off and artists have more and more ownership over their work, um, the role of a label becomes very confusing. Like if you're selling 50% of your masters to a label, the label better be doing something in return. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's a very interlocking question. Um, as Jewel says, like the tastemaker is becoming a little bit more obsolete. So mm -hmm. if we're not looking to blogs and publications and et cetera, et cetera, to push music forward, then maybe you don't need a publicist. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't need a publicist, maybe you don't need a label to pay for your publicist. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm really thinking about labels as um, media platforms more and more, like as a means to, to push forward a narrative for a collective of artists um, and to, to help those artists generate content that is cohesive and, and keeps them within a community. Um, and I, I hope that that's where the value of the label world exists. But the traditional model of sell 50% of your masters to this label and then they'll service you to radio stations <laughs> certainly is not going to get anyone very far these days. Mm. But in closing, you know, I was very fascinated a couple of weeks ago what Interscope Records did um, for their anniversary, where they really took a step back. So they have vinyl, you know, that they created like from uh, the artists, like on their like Billie Eilish, uh, Dr. Dre, uh, Kendrick Lamar. And they really took like a deeper dive look at like, the intersection of art and music and then they they aligned the the different the vinyl so like for the 30th anniversary like the limited edition like vinyl like of their greatest hits from back in the day when to your point it was all about the masters and all about you know all that stuff and then merge them with like um artists visual artists that were just taking off and limited edition vinyl, hundred pieces, famous artist, famous musician, visual artist, famous musician, and and they introduced it on this amazing tech, this new like live e-commerce tech platform called Network. Just absolutely brilliant. So they're looking at and using all the different business models that are out there that are emerging, like e live e-commerce and what. And I just like, it was crazy. Like everybody, like they had the different drops. They, they're like, okay, so tomorrow there's Dr. J, Dr. Dre's uh, limited edition vinyl uh, with the artwork by Kenji Wiley. And, you know, so I was like, had my notifications on, like for all the music that I liked. And I'm like, it's like two in the morning and it's like, bing. And I was like, oh my God, let me sign on and see what they're saying about it. So I can be one of the, get maybe one of the 100. So, I mean, it's like also about like looking at all these amazing tools that are out there and reinventing, you know, so not everything is about beyond the music label, but like, I'm telling you, it's about going, we're going back in time, like pick up the pen and the paper, send some notes, don't send an email, like you got to use these like old school taxis, like diversify with the old school, the new school, and then stand out in ways like that. Just be creative, just continue to be creative in different ways for sure okay I think I think we can probably wrap here um that was a really great discussion thank you both so much for participating thank you for having us yes thanks to Sled Island and thank you Annabelle for your rousing discussion yes okay thanks so much yeah to Baita and Sled Island and everyone who tuned in and we'll see you next time Cheers.